Um, all right, it's time for the meat of the program. And for that, I'd like to turn it over to my co-founder at Startup Stack. We need to spotlight her. Uh, Laura Good is going to have a little fireside chat with, with Aaron Klein, the CEO and co-founder of Riskalyze. So let's get them spotlit and let them take it away. Hello, everybody. So let me get my right chart document open here. So Aaron, it's been a long time since you and I spoke. It has. It might have been, I mean, honestly, it might have been at Monk's Cellar, like, like Jeff was just t telling us yeah. about. So uh, you never know. Yeah. Um, other than yeah. exchanging comments on social media. <laughs> other so, than that. Other than yeah, that. That's yeah, right. That's yeah. right. So if you all join me in welcoming Aaron, Aaron's the co-founder and CEO of Auburn-based Risk Alive. And I've known Aaron, uh, well, I, I use our LinkedIn profiles to figure out how long I've known okay. you. 2009, I think wow. we probably first met uh, maybe on Twitter. I think that's right. Yep. It, it was before you officially started Risk Alive. It was. So I've had the pleasure of seeing you go from zero to uh, 100,000 miles or whatever it is now. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. I thank you for having me. And um, that is wild that it was 2009. I, I remember 2009 very well, because I spent basically 2007 to 2011, um, you know, working in a in a job because I had to put like food on the table for my family. And um, I really felt like I was in exile, like I'd, I'd done a startup, it had failed, it hadn't worked out. Uh, I had to shut that down, had to go to work, you know, and, uh, and, and, and start a regular job. And, uh, and I was two years into that. And I'm like, I, I, I have got to figure out, um, you know, how I can go like start something new. And, um, you know, and, 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 and so I, 2009, I don't think it's a mistake that we met then, Laura, because I was like trying to figure out um, you know, think through ideas and figure out how to start something new. And it took me another two years before uh, I was ready to make the leap. And we started Risk Class in March of 2011. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Some of our audience may not know anything about Risk Alive, which sure. um, could you just give us a, uh, just a quick overview yeah. of uh, what Risk Alive is? Just Absolutely. A brief intro to the company. Sure. Um, so we're, we're focused on, um, on financial advisors. That's our market. So we serve financial advisors um, who um, uh, serve individual clients with how they manage their investments. But if you think about like why we started the company and how we started the company, um, it's actually built around a really interesting mission because we really felt like investing felt broken for a lot of people. Like they put money into it. And it felt a little bit like a black box, like they weren't really sure, you know, why they got a good result or a bad result out of it. And if you look at um, a lot of how investing works, it actually, you know, our, our, our psychology works against us. When markets are going up and markets are, you know, are, are rising, uh, we're feeling successful, we want to put more risk in our, you know, on and we want to put more money in our accounts and we want to, you know, make this happen more, right? Uh, and then when markets pull back and start to drop, we start feeling anxious and worried about that. And we start wanting to take risk off and we start wanting to like pull money out of our accounts. And, you know, effectively, if you were to draw a chart of this, what you're doing is you're, you're buying high and you're selling low, right? And, and that's the exact opposite of what we should do to be successful investors. And, you know, that is a, just a core problem where human psychology tends to sabotage uh, us as investors. And we really felt like that needed to change. And so, um, you know, ultimately we, we started the company around the idea that if we could help financial advisors on, you know, kind of build a framework for their clients to understand and react to risk appropriately, we could literally transform a fearful investor who makes bad short-term decisions into a fearless investor who actually makes great short-term decisions. And, you know, it turns out great short-term decisions are the fuel, the input that amazing financial advisors use to actually create those long-term financial outcomes uh, for people. And so, 
um, you know, here we are a decade later, we serve tens of thousands of financial advisors across the country. Um, they've delivered over 5 million risk numbers uh, to their clients. We invented this thing called the risk number, a one to 99 scale. And so the software really helps clients or helps financial advisors understand who their clients are on that one to 99 risk number scale, and then match that up to the amount of risk in their investment portfolios. And we do a lot since then. We do portfolio analytics. We help them create proposals. We help them trade client accounts. We help them do compliance. Um, you know, we help them uh, do investment research. But you know, it all started from that cornerstone of risk, and we still do it all through the lens of using risk to engage with a financial advisor's clients. And uh, that's really what makes us unique in the marketplace today. Awesome. And about how many employees do you have now, Aaron? Pretty close to 200. It's a little bit less than 200, I think, right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is it still just the two locations or do you, I know you have one. No. Auburn. So, well, you know, let's not forget that we've been through a global pandemic. So we are now about 200 decentralized coins on the blockchain. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> other than, um, uh, you know, the truth is we have an office in Auburn. Uh, it's built for 185 people. We have about 30, 35 that come to work here now. Um, we are, hold on one quick second. I'm sorry. I'm actually on an interview. We just skipped today. It's all good. Cleaning crew was here. Cleaning crew here to take out the trash, but we'll just skip today. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so, um, uh, I'm cracking up because she's probably she's like that nice young man is interviewing for a job in there. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, so uh, what was I saying? Where was I? I totally lost. Uh, it. You're talking. You told yeah, us. Yeah, Auburn. So I'm sitting in Auburn. Yeah, built for 185. We have about 35 people showing up to work here. In Atlanta, we have an office built for like 80, 85 people. We have two people showing up to oh work at the God. Atlanta office where I really love making that $44,000 a month rent payment for that, for that office space. It's, oh. it's great. Uh, but uh, we, are, we are close to uh, handing off that lease in one more year. So that, that's, that's all good. We're going to turn Atlanta in. We still got like 35 people in Atlanta. They just don't want to commute in. And so, you know, post pandemic. And so we're going to turn Atlanta into a, what we call a talent center. Um, we already had a talent center in Philadelphia. We've got about 15 people in Philadelphia. Um, there are probably five or six other companies in our space. So there's just a lot of, you know, talent in the wealth tech space in Philadelphia. And so that's been a, a great talent center for us. And then we probably have 15 people in Poland of all places. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. And Riskalyze Poland, we actually do have an office there uh, and uh, it's, it's R&D focused. Uh, but, you know, effectively that gave us a strategy to hire the engineers, the, the number of engineers that we needed to hire, but also afford to like retain all of our U.S. based engineers that we had mm -hmm. uh, by kind of dollar cost averaging that and, and finding a way to retain the folks that we had, but also get the engineers that we need. Yeah. Uh, Brian posted a question. We'll get to that, Brian. I promise you. We will. So, That's good. Uh, so this is cool that. Uh, this is Global Entrepreneurship Week, and your company I, is now global. <laughs> I know. It's wild. And we're, we're actually looking, there, we'll, we'll probably open another office. We're actually actively thinking South America, uh, LATAM, somewhere there, um, you know, could be somewhere else in Eastern Europe as well. So yeah, we're rapidly becoming a bit more of a global organization, which uh, I think is kind of cool, especially on Global Entrepreneurship Week. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, who, who would have thought that 10 years ago? Huh? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? <laughs> Not me. So, so now we have kind of a clearer picture of, of where you are today. Yeah. Um, I love the movies where they do these cinematic flashbacks. So <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do that for our audience today. Okay. And um, let's go back to understand a little bit more about your entrepreneurial journey, mm. which uh, you've shared some of it, but I'm going to go way back. Okay. And uh, where did you grow up, Aaron? Yeah, so I actually, well, let's see, I started life down in, um, in the Los Angeles area in Burbank. Um, and that's what made me, you know, I, I would duck if we were in person. That's what made me a Dodgers fan. 
Um, it's true. I'm, 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 a, I'm a Dodgers fan, but nobody's perfect. Okay. Um, but my, you know, my, my brother is eight years younger than I am. And we moved North when I was seven. So you can imagine he's a Giants fan. However, we think he was possibly dropped on his head as a child because he's also a Raiders fan. So we don't really understand that at all. But, uh, but anyway, um, he's, uh, yeah. So, so LA for like seven years, but I really grew up here. Like I've lived now up here in this area. I mean, I'm 43 so that you can do the math. Like I've lived up here the vast, vast, vast majority of my life and, um, just really love this area and love this region. Um, and it's been a fantastic place to grow up. It's been a fantastic place to, um, you know, to, to, to start a family and start a business. Um, you know, when I was like 12 years old, uh, I went to work in the afternoons after school for my dad. Uh, and he had, he was also an entrepreneur, had a wholesale distribution company in automatic gates and security equipment. And um, that was like a brutal business, like no original product. You're distributing somebody else's product. So it's all commoditized. You know, you've got the same product everybody else has. Um, real, I mean, brutal margins. You've got like 18% gross margins. Um, and, you know, he taught me a lot of really cool things. I mean, I worked for him from 12 to probably age 24. So, um, he taught me the grit that it takes to be an entrepreneur. That business was never like wildly successful. It was successful, but it was not like blow up wild. Like at our peak, we had five employees. Okay. Um, but it made a living for those five people. And um, it, it, it definitely delivered a lot of value to the clients that it served. And, you know, the other thing that he really taught me was just um, that if you, that, that I, I, don't, I think a lot of people have lost sight of this, like business is personal, that if you take really good care of clients, like they will take good care of you. And um, that's always stuck with me because, you know, there was literally, we had almost no competitive advantages, like almost none. And it was just about relationships with all those installing dealers who would actually install the equipment at people's homes and businesses around the area. And we just worked really hard to take good care of them. We just worked really hard to always be like, um, you know, calling them when there was a problem and letting them know when a shipment was delayed or, you know, when it was when they might need to reschedule their job or something like that. And as a result, we just had a lot of loyalty as a result. Um, and um, it taught me a lot. And, and I think uh, you know, gave me a, a lot of interesting lessons that I was able to take into other businesses. Although one thing it really taught me was that I wanted to be in a high margin business, like, uh, like software, like the internet. So there you go. Yeah. So, um, do you write software? Did you learn software development yourself? So my coding skills are stuck in like 1999. You know, so uh -huh. like I, I, I did a bunch of like visual basic and did a, did a little bit of, of C++ and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and then I did a little bit of coding. I mean, I say 1999. I did a little bit of coding on the on the web um, in, you know, like dot net and, and some other languages like that. Um, when that was very well done that you dodged that spider. Laura. <laughs> Oh, well, well played. Um, I saw that move. I wasn't sure exactly what it was. But dodging a spider. That's that's impressive. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I did I did a bit of coding, but I have to say, like, I haven't really used that skill set since maybe 04, 05. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think I so I'm, I'm good enough at the technology to be dangerous, um, but I definitely kind of found my forte um, in in kind of being technical enough to understand what was possible with the technology, but really understanding the market and how to meet the market. And so I don't know if you want to call that product. People would, you know, people inside of our company say Aaron is a product focused CEO, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I also spend a lot of time with customers. So you could call that sales. Um, I am not a financial wizard, but I have to know my way around a balance sheet and an income statement. So, you know, uh, in my job, you kind of have to do all three of those areas, but probably my first love is product. Mm -hmm. Okay. So talking about product, maybe I'll segue yeah. into this. Um, I believe you've been involved or helped start three startups. Is that, is that the right number? That seems memory. right. Yeah. yeah. So one of them is, a, or I guess you would say two of them are a little blurry together, but I can, mm -hmm. I can talk about that if you want. Yeah. 
yeah, tell us about your, your early experience sure. with being a co-founder. So I'm working for my dad and we are in this like 18% gross margin commoditized business that I was telling you about. And the internet has come along and I have, you know, so I have like computerized my dad's business. Um, we installed, you know, windows for work groups and actually had computers like talking to each other and trying to like, you know, uh, computerize orders. Everything before that was on paper, right? So we're, we're computerizing orders from customers and inventory and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, windows for work groups comes out and I like actually connect the computers together in the office. And then we have email. My dad is like, this is totally stupid. Like why we're, we're sitting three feet from each other. Like, I'll just write a note to the person and put it on their desk. Like, you know, so, so trying to, you know, trying to run a little local Microsoft mail server on windows for work groups. So, uh, you know, uh, eventually the internet comes along and, um, and then my dad was aware of the internet coming along because it was this really annoying thing that was tying up the fax line all the time, you know? Um, and so, so anyway, I, I, I you know, on and on and on it goes, like we got to about, I think it was 2000. And I was just like, you know, dad, um, there's a lot of interesting opportunity here. Like uh, another coworker and I at my dad's company, I'm like, why don't we try to get something started here around the internet? We didn't really know what that was, but like, why don't we try and get something started here and we'll cut you in as a third partner. So you keep paying our salaries and we'll, you know, juggle working, you know, here in the distribution business. And um, you know, working, uh, on, on that. And, uh, and so we, we started doing that. So we started this company, uh, which I believe the name that we settled on, that's probably on my LinkedIn says Vestiva. Um, but I think it went through a different name before that. I can't really remember, but we were basically, you know, doing like websites for clients using cold fusion was, was kind of the big hot technology at the time. Um, and, uh, and so that morphed pretty quickly into doing websites um, for political candidates and political, um, you know, parties. And that was really interesting, except that there's a couple things I've heard. So that's like where we started to get some traction. Um, but I forgot something about that business that's really bad, which is that it is incredibly seasonal. Like, there are not elections many years, right? And so there's like literally nothing to do or make money on in some years. But in um, uh, to make a long story short, it kind of morphed into a bit of a payments business. Like in 2002, well, in 2000, John McCain won the Republican primary for president against George W. Bush. And he had johnmccain.com across his podium. And he raised like a million dollars online on New Hampshire primary night. And nobody had ever seen that happen before. And so in 2002, everybody running for like dog catcher wanted to raise money online, right? And they're going to their bank. There's no Stripe, there's no PayPal, there's no Square, there's nothing like this. So people are going to a bank to get a merchant account, these political campaigns, and they're like, I, you know, I need a merchant account. And the bank's like, we need three years of financials and a business plan. And they're like, dude, we're a political campaign. Like, <laughs> here's our business plan. Win, lose, or draw, we will be out of business in November. Okay, you know? And so um, banks were not really excited about doing that. So we got like four merchant accounts and stitched them all together and wrote all the software to kind of make it seamless. And we would process the transactions and we were charging like eight, nine percent on the money because it was crazy risky because if if the political candidate like lost and then their supporters were like, screw that guy and like charged back their credit cards like we were holding the bag, you know, and so we it, it was it was wild. So we did that in 2002, managed not to lose our shirts, managed to find a client. We got to work for one of the candidates for governor of California in 2003 in the recall election. Then we did the 2004 cycle. And then we're like, doesn't appear there's going to be another recall election in 2005. So there's literally nothing to do. So we sold that business to um, not for a lot of money, but like sold that business in a pretty minor way to a, um, a, a, a kind of a larger competitor who did political websites and things like that. And they didn't have any payments capability. And so we sold that to them. Um, and it, it worked out, it worked out pretty nicely in that. Um, the other thing I didn't really like about the political business is that you couldn't win on your merits. Like literally political can't, can't, um, consultants would say, oh, you worked for that guy. 
that guy's political consultant insulted, you know, a candidate I worked for like 30 years ago. So we can't work with you, you know, and things like that. It, it just, it just drove me crazy. So I, I was like, I want to work in a space where like we can have the best product and we can win um, on that basis. Yeah. Um, I was also pretty intrigued about the idea of software kind of going into the web at that, at that point. So when we sold that, we kind of sold it to focus on this idea that had cropped up um, and it became this thing called BizFlex um, to build software in the web that could actually stitch together companies like my dad's company. And so my dad, by that time, had sold his company and was working for, you know, the, the larger competitor he'd sold to. And so um, we went and pitched them on like, you know, you've got this horrible system that's local and you can't tell that like the Sacramento store has inventory and the Portland store doesn't and the Seattle store does, and you know, you can't figure out what's going on. And so like, we could tie all this together over the web and you could actually like, you know, be in the Sacramento store working with a customer and like order something to be drop shipped from Portland to that customer. <laughs> You know, they were like, oh, that sounds really cool. Like, that'd be amazing. And then I'm like, you know, you can even have your website integrated with this and the customer could come up with their own order in and, and have it shipped from whatever store has inventory. And they're like, oh my gosh, that would be incredible. You know, like these are the things we take for granted now, right? Yeah. And so we started building that um, in kind of the 2005 range and 2006. And, you know, man, I learned a lot of um, hard lessons with that company. For one thing, we had one customer and, um, and, and we, we scaled the company way too fast. Um, we also could not raise capital. Like I'm out there talking to different, you know, I, not that I knew a lot of venture capitalists, but the ones that I was talking to were either, um, you know, kind of with the conventional wisdom or I didn't know the right ones or whatever, but, but, you know, it was basically like, oh dude, like that market is over. They sell software in boxes. It's called QuickBooks. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> like, there, there's, there. That's not going to work, you know. And um, I, I, so we were a little bit ahead of our time, but I can't really just blame timing. Like, we also didn't, um, uh, for lack of a better term, we didn't live close to the ground. Like, we 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 were kind of scaling the company, um, and we were financing it off of like credit cards and you know home equity lines of credit. And, um, you know, it was not, I'll put it this way. If I'd have had this thing called Riskalyze, I never would have done it. Um, so uh, I, I did not, you know, and so I, I, I was taking a lot of risk. And um, if I, if I, I, I'm not sure I could have made that company successful then, but uh, the only way I could have would have been certainly not to scale up to 24 people with very little revenue and um, one customer, right? Like we needed to, to find the product market fit and then start scaling after we'd found that we needed to live closer to the ground, I would say, um, so that we could extend our runway until we like figured it out. There's, you know, and that, that's really the game of, of startups, right? Is like, you're just trying to like have enough money to turn over enough cards to like learn enough and figure enough things out that you survive to the point that like you, you, you've got a winning hand. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't play that well and we didn't have enough time to turn over enough cards. I still don't know if I kept turning over cards if we would have made that successful, but <laughs> I can tell you that the BizFlex software I just discovered. So I was at my dad's retirement party a couple months ago and the folks who bought his company, they're like, you know, we're still using BizFlex. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And they're like, oh yeah, we just paid a custom developer like 150 grand to come in and like upgrade a bunch of things. Oh and my like, gosh. Do that. And I'm like, <laughs> that is nuts. I forgot that we'd sold them the source code when we shut the company down. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, they're still using this thing we built back in 2006 and uh, God bless them. Yeah, so it, your story is not that unique among successful entrepreneurs that I've met. Most of them, uh, have a couple of things that didn't quite work out, yeah. uh, but there was something in their blood that made them want to have their own company. Yeah. So they would, you know, move on from what they'd learned and try something else. Yeah. So do you do you find that to be true with the? No, I think that is true, and I think you know when that, you know, first of all, it was really devastating when it shut down. We thought that we were about to raise capital, and so we were very like we 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 went. I mean, nobody can say that we didn't have faith in ourselves. Like we were, 
we were putting it all on credit cards and home equity lines of credit. And like, we were going 90 miles an hour when we slammed into the brick wall and, you know, and we all lost our jobs, including me. And then, you know, here's the crazy thing. Um, I, I looked at that and I'm like, I'm probably going to have to go bankrupt. Like, I really don't want to go bankrupt. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, you know, um, I sat down with the three, you know, the three partners in the business. And I'm like, if we refinance all of this, I don't have as much home equity as some of you do, but like, I think we have enough debt capacity that we can do this. And we refinanced all of it into our houses. And I basically just made a second house payment for the next, you know, large number of years. Um, and it was almost like student loan debt to some extent um, mm -hmm. with really, really expensive tuition. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I, again, wouldn't do it that way again. Um, couldn't do it that way again, but, uh, I, there was something that, you know, it's a really painful experience. I, I went and I took that job because I needed to make some money and make those payments. Right. And I needed to put food on the table for my family. Um, and so, um, so, so I spent those next four years. It really did feel like exile. And I, you know, I wasn't expecting to start another company when I first went into that. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm done with that. Like, I'm going to go, you know, into the corporate world, use some of my product skills, some of my technical skills and things like that. I, I became, um, you know, I think the title was like global head of product for this division of an options brokerage firm. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a really interesting experience. I had a great boss there. Um, she was really great to work for. But otherwise, that was a really rough company, bad culture, um, you know, like, like, I, just so many things about that company that were that were tough, really tough. And um, I will say that I made a long list of things that I uh, wanted to do differently if I, um, if I, if I ever started a company again. And I, I really remember throughout 2008, like wrestling with that and thinking like, should I, should I start a company again? Like I, I, I started to get that itch again. And it, it was only a year since like, you know, this PTSD inducing like crash into the brick wall. Right. And I'm like, what, what am I thinking that I would do that? Um, but by 2009, I really started to go, I'm going to start, I'm going to start a new company. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know exactly what it will be. Um, I had some ideas around this risk idea. I'd been talking with this buddy of mine, Mike McDaniel, who ended up becoming my co-founder. Uh, and we talked about some different things. And, um, and so I, I had an idea it might be that, uh, but I actually turned that idea down and said, no, like I'm, I'm not going to be part of starting a company around that. Um, I did eventually change my mind, as, as you know. But, um, but I, you know, that was the journey I was on. So it was 2009 uh, when I kind of decided, yes, I am going to do this at some point and started like trying to reconnect to entrepreneurial resources, got connected with you over Twitter, got connected with, you know, Sarda in those days was just, you know, trying to follow some of what was going on in the Sacramento ecosystem and uh, started reading uh, Fred Wilson's blog, uh, A AVC, I think it's called avc.com. Uh, and there was a really vibrant community back in those days in the comments on his blog, met um, the guy who eventually became my CEO coach at one point in the future, met a guy who became one of my board members at one point in the future, met another guy who invested in the company and uh, became like an advisory board member at some point in the future. Like, so um, just started getting connected to the, you know, the startup ecosystem again and thinking about the process of maybe starting a company and then it took two years from 2009 to 2011 to actually, um, you know, uh, decide to do it and lay the groundwork and then, um, you know, figure out what we were going to do and then actually go start the company. That's, a, that's an awesome story. So uh, along the way, yeah, and this might get to Brian's question, uh, were there any major pivots that you made in your assumptions or your product that you needed to make to successfully commercialize? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we, we get into 2011 and, um, you know, we decided to, to start the company. Well, I, it kind of goes into the discussions we were having in 08 and 09 and 10, because it was, it was really interesting. In, in, in 08, I think that was when my buddy, Mike McDaniel, who's a financial advisor, um, we're just talking and like, I'm like, it is crazy how the average individual thinks about the concept of risk. And he says, if you think that's crazy, 
you should see how many of us financial advisors think about it. Like we just haven't had the tools in this industry to really understand who our clients are and kind of match that up to the risk in their portfolios. And so we're, we're talking about all that. And he goes, you know, I've got a buddy of mine who actually holds a couple patents on, you know, some ideas around like how to really capture what somebody's true risk tolerance is and quantify it using a mathematical function. And I'm like, that's really interesting. Um, so he shared with me in 2008, this like 50 page technical paper. And I mean, like, I, 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 I hopefully will not like make you not want to invite me back to start up second. Like I am not that good at math. Like I, I I'm, I'm okay at math, but I'm not that good at math. Like I'm reading this technical paper and my eyes are just like glazing over. And um, so I'm like trying to go, is there a product hidden in this technical paper somewhere? And I, I really couldn't see it. Like I did not have the vision to see the product in the technical paper. And I was trying to talk to some other people and, and um, you know, and, and, uh, and just, you know, get a sense of that. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see the product. And when I'm talking to that other friend, we're talking about it, he, you know, his initial idea, he was like, oh yeah, this is a website like Yahoo that has ads on it. And I'm like, I know nothing about advertising businesses and how those work. Like, I am not the guy for this. If this is a, an advertising play, like, I don't know anything about that. And so, uh, so I, I actually turned it down. I'm like, you know what, Mike, this is not for me. Like, there's probably somewhere out there that someone out there, this is for, but it's kind of not for me. And uh, Mike was really bummed because he had gone through this process with that mutual friend on a whiteboard. It wasn't software, right? It was this mathematical process and he'd gone through it. It took three hours. That was part of my lack of vision of not being able to see it as a product. And I'm like, who's gonna sit there for three hours and go through this process, okay? Um, but he, he, it took three hours. And so, um, so anyway, all this to be said, um, it was probably 2010 that Mike invited me over to dinner and I said, hey, did anything ever come with that risk thing? And he goes, I thought you'd never ask. I went and hired a college kid and I built a prototype and they turned it into software and it had shrunk it from three hours to about 15 painful minutes. Um, and it was the ugliest prototype I'd ever seen, but I was able to like, for the first time go, okay, I see how this might work. I also had learned a ton um, in my time then at, at the options brokerage firm about, you know, a little bit more about how the financial services industry is working, because that was kind of my first, even though we'd done the payments thing, it was really kind of my first entree into financial services. And so I learned a little bit more about that. And I st it started to come together for me. I'm like, I could see this working and I could see it working a couple of different ways, but I think it's a SaaS software business that sells to financial advisors, but that gets me to the pivot question you asked, because when we first put the plan together, I'm like, guys, financial advisors, the only thing that they have is their reputation with their clients. Like no great financial advisors are going to road test brand new risk technology on their clients. That's not going to happen. So we have to validate, if this technology is truly this great, we have to validate this. Um, you know, with, with consumers in some way. So we always thought we were going to get to advisors, but we actually said to ourselves, that's 2015. We are going to, in 2011, build this for consumers. We're going to build a free website and we're going to let people capture their risk number. Um, I had done a bunch of work and research around what it would take to bridge capturing what an individual's risk number was and then figuring out how to calculate the risk in a portfolio and align that. And so, um, uh, you know, in all those discussions with the team, we kind of came up with this concept of the risk number as a speed limit sign, our one to 99 range. And like, how do you do a risk number for the portfolio and a risk number for the human being and figure out how to demonstrate that those two things are aligned? That turned out to be, frankly, like, the the most valuable part of the whole business like that was the foundation the business ended up being built on and it was like how do we illustrate this and we came up with a speed limit sign like kind of crazy okay and and so the pivot part was that you know the business plan when we went out and raised money from angel investors we raised money from angel investors friends and family network I was not in a position, I've got two house payments the equivalent to make okay I'm not in a position to work for free 
I just can't do it. And that's how most startups get started. And I'm just like, I can't do that, guys. And Mike's like, I, I think I know enough people. A lot of them are financial advisors. They can see why we want this kind of product in the world. Like, I think we can raise the capital to, to go do this. And so I definitely took a really low salary, but I took enough salary that I could, you know, kind of kind of make ends meet for myself and my wife and two kids at the time. And so um, we, uh, we, we launched out there in 2011, we raised the capital from angel investors. And that business plan was, we are going to build for consumers for like four years. And in 2012, we are going to license this to like Charles Schwab or E-Trade or Fidelity or Scott Trade or one of these, you know, big uh, retail brokers. And we, we did, you know, we did a lot of thinking. And remember, I had some experience working for the options brokerage firm. So I'm like, I think we can pull in six to $12 million a year in revenue from that if we can figure out how it can, you know, generate activity among investors for these firms. So um, it was 2012 was our year of successful failure. Okay. The success part is we rolled that product out live on the web. It was a great success. You know, unlike my last startup, we didn't spend our first half million dollars on servers. Amazon Web Services existed now. So we got to spend like 400 bucks, you know, for servers for, for month one, right? Um, and, and, and so there were a lot of things that had happened to make the technology, um, you know, uh, uh, better and, 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 and make it our moment for it to work. Um, in 2012, we rolled that out. And uh, the successful part of the year was that we got PR in like Barron's, NPR, um, uh, what was the other one? New York Times, New York Times covered mm -hmm. us. And, and so, you know, all that was just like grit and hustle. Um, if anybody remembers Josh Morgan, Morgan Dorado, public relations mm -hmm. here locally, he's now, he now runs communications at Sierra College, but it was his firm and he was very involved with startups. And he, for a like, like pennies on the dollar fee took us on with PR and tried to help us get some of that initial PR and did a great job. So we got all this PR. We had users come in and build $2 billion worth of portfolios on that platform. Average account size, $27,000. People are like loving creating their risk number, loving matching that up with how they've got their $25,000 E-Trade account invested. And so we're like, this is working. Like this is working. And, um, I'm out on the road trying to get one of these retail brokerage firms to give me $6 million a year, right? Like that's, that, it's, it's that simple, okay? In hindsight, you know, and again, we, we'd never be who we are today without um, having gone through 2012. But in hindsight, one of the flaws of that strategy is there were five potential customers on the face of planet Earth, right? And rapidly, like three of them you know, dropped out. They're like, we don't work with outside partners for, our, for technology on our retail platform. We just don't do it. E-Trade wanted to do the deal. And they were like almost sliding into bankruptcy that year, lost their CEO, just like could not get a deal done. TD Ameritrade actually said, we want to do this. We're in. Okay. I'm like, we did it. Like I've been, I've been working my tail off all throughout 2012 trying to do that. They're like, we're in. I fly to Baltimore to one of their offices there and we start hashing things out. And I quickly realized that like, we have more enemies in the room than we have like proponents oh. in the room. And, mm. you know, one of the enemies is like, um, hey, question for you, what technology, what's your tech stack? And I start talking about web services and all the latest and greatest, you know, stuff that we were using in our tech stack to, you know, kind of a traditional lamp stack at the time. Uh, and, and suffice it to say, they go, oh, shoot, we're on ASP Classic. Like, we can't even talk to web services. Like, we have to wait until we've, you know, like, rolled out our new thing. And so, like, come back and talk to us in four to six quarters, which is big company speak for don't come back and talk to us at all, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so that was the big pivot, you know, that Brian mentioned. And I, I, I love Brian. He's been a friend a long time, and he's followed our story. And, and thanks for being here, Brian. Um, but I, you know, that was the big pivot for us is I flew back home on that, on that flight from Baltimore. And that was um, right before Labor Day weekend of 2012. And I remember somewhere I've got like the notebook page and I wrote what I call the Apollo 13 question at the top of the page. And it's the question that Gene Kranz, the flight director asked about the spaceship holding the astronauts that they had to figure out how to get back home. And he said, what do we have on the ship that's good? 
right? Like a lot had gone wrong. And the question he asked was like, what do we have on the ship that's good? And I've, I wrote that across the top of the notebook page. And then I'm just sitting there, you know, in like seat 43 um, C back in, uh, you know, middle seat cramped in like this, trying to take notes on my, and I'm, and I'm thinking on this long flight home. And, um, and I, and all I could really write down was like great risk technology, $2 billion worth of validation. That's really all we had on the ship that was good. And I, I, I got the team together in our little office Labor Day weekend of 2012. And I'm like, look, we've got like three months of money in the bank. Like if we're going to go down, let's go down swinging. Let's rebuild the product for advisors and let's try to make our $2 billion of validation prove that like this is technology worth using as a financial advisor and um so we started working on that and we had a really rough product about three or four weeks later mind you we built all the core technology and it had taken months but like we were able to rebuild it into a product for a really rough product for advisors about three or four weeks later and there was a conference going on down in san diego called stocktoberfest and there was a financial advisor speaking at that conference who was on CNBC every two or three days. His name's Josh Brown. He's a buddy of mine, and he's still on CNBC every two or three days. And I basically, you know, I, I'm not proud to admit this, but I basically stalked Josh Brown. Like, I, I cold emailed him, and I'm like, hey, um, I'd love to show you this thing that we're building. You know, it's going to do all these cool things. And he's like, oh, that sounds really interesting. You know, definitely, like, say hi to me at the conference, and I'll take a look at your thing. So, like, I flew to that conference and I'm like, I will not leave that conference without meeting Josh Brown and getting to show him Riskalyze, right? And like, that was my plan. It would, you know, and um, uh, he, you know, I, I finally bugged him enough, I think at that conference that he's finally like, okay, I gotta go look at this guy's thing. He's not gonna leave me alone until he'll, until I look at his thing. And so he sat down and like, he, he just got really excited about it. He starts looking at the product and he's like, oh, wow. He goes, I can totally see how this is going to work with my clients. Like, I want to I wanna be your first customer and I want to know how I can help. And I was just blown away, right? Like, that was just like, whoa. Um, Josh joined our advisory board. I put him in the uh, investor deck very, very quickly. Um, we went out and, you know, started talking to some of the investors that we were talking to. It was enough smoke that they stood behind us and funded us, uh, you know, for a few more months for us to basically get the advisor product out of beta, which was March of 2013. And then it kind of just took off like a rocket. And in March of 2013, I mean, we had like five customers, six customers, and we ended the year probably with 300 or so. Um, we ended the following year with almost 3,000 um you know and so on and so forth and it just it just kind of blew up from there and so uh, it, it it has been a wild journey ever since but that was the crazy pivot that got us um off off the ground was shifting from you know this this in theory great idea of going to the public uh and then going uh you know the people who are who we can actually drive real value to and who are willing to pay for that value in the closest way, um, you know, to, to success, um, you know, we were able to shift to that and, uh, and get traction with them and, and it worked. Awesome. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they look at a company like yours that's successful and, and they think you had it easy or that it happened overnight, but it was uh, a 10 uh, year overnight success. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. And uh, <laughs> three years of the customer discovery process, right. With your, <laughs> right. Testing right. your business ideas. So. Totally. Well, yeah. and, and that doesn't even count, um, you know, the couple of years before that, where we were in idea phase before we actually like went out there and actually, you know, kind of quit our jobs and started and raised the capital and started the company. Right. Yeah. So, so that you're, you're absolutely right. It's not, it's not a, it's not an overnight process. That's right. for sure. For sure. So um, let's shift a little bit. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about company culture. I've heard a lot of great yeah. things about um, the culture at Risk Lies, mainly that the culture is super important to, to mm -hmm. you, the founders. So at what point did you decide that you needed to formalize the culture at Risk Lies with your employees? And, and also, what are some of Risk Lies's key values? Sure, absolutely. Um, 
So I, I would tell you that like um, we, first of all, because of my experience with that um, uh, uh, options brokerage firm and just the challenge of that culture um, as I saw it, um, I was kind of attuned to the idea that we needed, um, we needed to start with core values. And so we actually started on day one of the company, March 1, 2011, um, we, we started those first couple of days up in Reno. We got like a, a cheap conference room at like the Atlantis Casino and Resort and, and spent a couple of days like hammering out our plans. And it was just me and it was the two people that we'd hired um, at, you know, and, 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 and were co-founders in every sense of the word because they were there on day one. And then Mike McDaniel came along. Mike, uh, you know, absolutely a co-founder, wasn't able to be involved day to day in the company because he was a financial advisor and their regulatory situation, particularly how he was set up as a financial advisor, wouldn't allow him to do what's called OBA, outside business activity. So he, you know, he couldn't have an office, couldn't have a title. I talked to him every day. He had lots of ideas, but he couldn't actually take an active day-to-day -day role in the company. Um, and so, but he came up, took a couple of days off and came up for, for our kind of offsite to kick off the company. And I remember talking about, you know, some core values and talking about that with, the, with, with this little team as we were setting out on this mission. And I, I was just like, you know, I've just been through a pretty rough experience from the standpoint of company culture. Um, I'm like, so I can tell you what kind of organization I don't want to have, Okay. And um, I can tell you what kind of organization I do want to have. And I jotted these, you know, these things down. We edited them a little bit, talked about them a little bit, and we settled on kind of seven core values at that point in time. And then in all candor, like it's three of us on a day to day, right? Like the company started in my basement and it was a year and a half before we had an office. And then in that office, we had like, you know, three, four, five people. So it really wasn't until like, the middle of 2013, when we hit like five or six people, Mike actually was able to sell part of his business and reorganize to um, become the kind of financial advisor who could join us. So he joined in the middle of 2013. And, um, you know, we had five, six people in the summer of 2013. And it was really clear that the company was starting to go. That was when we started to pay attention to them again. Not to say that we completely ignored them the first two years, but it was three people, right? And they're kind of mm -hmm. on the wall and we're not really paying that much attention to it. Um, but values come into play when there's stress in the organization. There's not a lot of stress before you have customer. I mean, there can be stress of different kinds, right? But like you don't have organizational stress before you have problems like customers and users and, and things like that, right? And so it was when we started to scale as an organization and going from three to six is, is, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but it was doubling who our organization was, right? And so it was that summer of 2013 that we really started formalizing it. Now, this is a really important part of our culture. Um, I don't know if you want me to throw it up on the screen real quick. Um, you need to enable screen sharing, but I was going to just like pull it up. Uh, yeah, uh, Cameron will need to give you that. I don't know if that works, Cameron. Uh, it just says that it's disabled it. But if that doesn't work, that's not a big deal. Okay, no worries. Um, so, I, you know, you can check this out for yourself. You can go to riskalyze.com slash values. And um, I see Brian saying, I heard that the Riskalyze culture revolves around Aaron's lame dad jokes. You know, I, I've tried, Brian, but like, no, unfortunately, the Riskalyze <laughs> culture has all but rejected my lame dad jokes. But, you know, I, I mean, I mean, you know, Switzerland is a great country. We're not exactly sure, but their flag is a plus. But anyway, we could we could go on all night. But go to riskalyze.com slash values if you want to check those out. Um, uh, yeah, I see Jamie Bell, uh, a Riskalyze uh, alumni here. And she talks about teamwork as one of her favorite values. I love that. So, you know, riskalyze.com slash values, you can see our nine values. So it's nine values now. And I got to tell you, um, this has been one of the most powerful things for us as an organization. We live by these. We operate by these. These are real. Um, and you talk to anybody who is an active riskalyzer and almost everybody who is a risk alumni like Jamie. Jamie says they're on the walls. They are. Um, but, you know, I, I feel with all respect to your comment, Jamie, I feel like a lot of companies put their values on the walls and then they never see them again. They never talk about them again and they never use them again. And what I love is that people like Jamie and others who are, who are in our culture actually operationalize and use these values every day. And so 
we, we, I hear people and it just makes my day. They're like, uh, we're an open and direct communication culture. Like, I'm going to need you to be more clear on that. Right. Like we're an accountability culture. Like that needs to be better or you're going to screw up our company. Okay. Like I, and, 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 you know, we, 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 I, I watch people exhibit empathy because of our respect value. And I watch people exhibit um, customer obsession because of our delight value. And we're obsessed with engineering moments of delight for our customers. So, um, you know, it really has been a very, very powerful tool for us. Um, and whenever we've gotten into trouble as a company, it's because we have not necessarily lost sight of our values, but lost sight of how we ensure that we stick to them. And I'll tell you a quick story about how that happened. Um, we went through this really hard time in um, kind of not, not too long ago. It was basically, you know, end of 2017 through the end of 2018, maybe middle of 19. Okay. And the deal was, is we raised capital in 2016 uh, from FTV Capital. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd worked on, you know, basically early angel investors from 2011 to, to through 2015. And then we raised our first institutional capital in 2016 with FTV Capital. So for the first time, we have this flush balance sheet, right? Like we, we bring, we put like millions of dollars on the balance sheet and we need to invest that money to like scale our business, Okay. Well, you know, suffice it to say, um, uh, we, we really made some mistakes in hiring during that period of time. Um, I, up until about eh, early 2016, middle 2016, I did at least a 10 minute veto interview with every single person we were going to bring aboard. I called it, I called it the veto interview because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not assessing whether that person is good at their job. I'm just going to veto them if I think they're bad for our culture. Okay. And as a result, I got very high quality people coming into that funnel because managers knew I can't send this person to Aaron, like he's going to veto them. So I never actually exercised my veto, not even once. Okay. <laughs> so then people were like, Aaron, like we can't even get like a veto interview on your calendar for two weeks. This is insane. Like you're causing us to miss out on good candidates. Um, this is bad. And I'm like, oh, like I can't be the bottleneck. Like this is not good. I need to figure out, I need to grow up. I need to figure out how to scale this and, and let this scale. And I'm, and people were telling me, you've got to let go and you've got to trust your team. Okay. And that was not bad advice, but I will tell you what was bad, which was instead of replacing my veto interview with something else, I just let it go. Okay. I didn't replace it with something else. And so as a result, it took a couple of years for it to happen. But by the you know, middle to end of 2018, we brought the whole company together from all of our different locations into one spot. We called this celebration of awesomeness. Um, that's, our, that's our all company retreat. And suffice it to say that I looked around and I was not seeing as much awesomeness as I was hoping for. I was like, how in the name of heaven did that person get into my organization? How did that person get into my company? And it was a real wake up moment for me. Like I, I, I was like, this is bad. And, and you know, I, I, we were having some other challenges, had to make some changes to the leadership team. I just went through this like really hard time from October of 2018 to like middle of 2019 before I made those changes to the leadership team, really made a lot of changes to the sales team. Um, we, we, we turned over a lot of the organization. We still got people who were with us from the very beginning, but there are, there are very few people, frankly, who came to us in the 2016 to 2018 period that are still here. If so, they're really, really, really great people, let me tell you. Um, but what I learned from that was that that veto interview, rather than just letting it go, I had to replace it. And in late 2018, um, I created this thing called the nine values team and the nine values team are 18 people. And I exercise a veto over who goes on and off of that team. Okay. There are 18 people that I know, know our culture, love our culture, will, will absolutely like fight to the death to stop somebody from being hired into our organization that won't fit our culture. Um, I believe Jamie did a stint on the nine values team. I, 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 I wanted people like Jamie who cared about our culture to be the guardians of our culture. And 
you have to have every new hire has to do a 30 minute interview with somebody on the nine values team. And it has to be cross-functional because I don't want an engineer getting blinded by the competency of a, of a really smart engineering candidate and willing to, and, and basically they're willing to compromise on the cultural problem be, to get their brilliance. So I want a salesperson or a customer service person to go, I have no idea if this person is a smart engineer, but I know that they're a great fit for our culture, right? And so they have to be, the nine values interview has to be cross-functional. And it has saved our bacon. Like we have done so little bad hiring. We, we hire for culture and we hire for confidence as a result of really upgrading our hiring process that way. That's really a commitment to sure. I worked for a startup and uh, when we got to about 20 people, <laughs> that's when, when problems started. When we got to 80, you know, there were a lot of problems. If there so, were problems at 20, yeah. yeah if if yeah. they're not turned around, there's going to be problems at 80 for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, um, I want to give folks a Well, sure. I have one more culture-related question. And okay. I'm going to open it up. I'll try to be, I'll try to be more concise. Uh, no, that's all right. Um, so earlier this year, a uh, private equity firm, yeah. H HG, is that what they call themselves? Yes. Or, or is it HUD? Uh, no, it's HG. <laughs> <laughs> they bought a controlling interest in Risk Allies yeah. in a deal valued at over $300 million. So my question is, uh, how are you protecting your culture given that you're now uh, another company has a majority interest in you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So first of all, I'll just say that we did not disclose the uh, the terms of that deal. So I can't um, confirm uh, <laughs> what the Sacramento Business Journal vigorously reported. Um, uh, and uh, but but um, but God bless Mark Anderson. He has good sources. Um, but I'll, I'll say this. So HG is not another company. Um, they, they are a, they are a like a preeminent software and services investor in the world. They're probably one of only three that invest, um, in companies kind of at that scale. Um, and in that way, and, um, and, and, and they're, they're just an incredible firm. And so the, the background of that, um, that transaction is that we, um, you know, our angel investors who invested in 2011, you know, are basically talking to me at, you know, candidly, it was at the beginning of 2020. And they're like, Aaron, it seems like we've built a really, really successful company here. And I'm like, yes, we have. And they're like, I was 75 when I invested, going to turn 85 next year. When do I get <laughs> to spend all of this amazing money that we supposedly made? And I'm like, that's a really fair question. We need to figure out how to get you some liquidity for that. So um, then FTV Capital, who invested in 2016, well, I should say, then a global pandemic hit. And I'm like, guys, it's not happening in 2020. Like, we'll think about it next year. So we get into 2021. FTV Capital is coming up on five years, right? We have some ideas around what we can do to invest in growth. And FTV is like, uh, you're kind of like one of the last investments in Fund 4. Like, we're not really sure we can help fund that. And, you know, we're happy to stay invested in Riskalyze. We'll go seven years. We'll go eight but I'm not sure we have more capital to invest, right? And so I'm like, uh, I, I think it's time for us to like go out there and see if we can find a great capital partner to partner with and buy out the early angels and FTV. So that's what we did. That's what the HG transaction is. So HG does not want to run companies. Like they're not a company that runs companies or something like that. They are an investor. And so they have, um, you know, they're, they're a fantastic partner. They partnered with me and the management team. I rolled the majority of what I own in Riskalyze over into the newly recapitalized firm and partnered with them to basically buy out and wipe out all of those early angels and FTV capital. And so it was a blockbuster deal for them. Our earliest angels ended up making 50X their money. Our mm -hmm. most recent angels made about 8X their money and FTV made like 4X plus on their money. Uh, and so everybody was like incredibly pleased with the deal. And I am just thrilled because I'm having a blast in this job, right? Like I get to work with people I love, you know, on a problem I love serving the financial advisors that we love to serve. 
And I get to stay in this job now with a capital partner who wants to basically fund us to go out and do acquisitions. If we want, if we find opportunities where we want to do acquisitions, invest in R&D, you know, uh, grow new products, grow new capabilities for our customers. So I'm just really, really thrilled about that. Um, we've got the right capital partner. And I mean, I, I'm going to be CEO of this company for as long as I'm having a blast and I'm being effective in my job. Um, you know, they're, they, they do not want to run companies. They really invested. And that's part of why they, they, they said to me, like, look, this deal only works for us if you, uh, you know, roll a majority of what you own into Riskalyze. And I'm like, this deal only works for me if I roll a majority of what mm -hmm. I own in Riskalyze. I feel like I'm in the third inning of the baseball game. Right. And so um, there was just great alignment there. And we're really excited about working together yeah. in the future. Yeah, that does sound like a great deal. When I'm talking to really early entrepreneurs, you know, who are looking for investment, and usually it's ones who are looking for investment and they're really not ready for it yet. But they yeah. forget that part that people are investing in your company because they want to make money. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a donation. So, right. you know, they need to be thinking about, you know, what's the exit or the liquidity event that's going to pay off, uh, especially those early stage angel investors. Yeah, you're, sounds you're, like you're, you're not wrong. And that's a, that's a, you know, you know, so little in the early stages about exactly how that's going to look. Yeah. And you really, you know, I had to talk to those early angels and just go, look, I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but here's how big I think this could get. And here are the kind of ways that it could turn out that were really valuable. And here are the kind of players that are out there that we could, that could either buy us or, you know, frankly, if we build to this scale, there's always somebody who wants to own a high quality software company that is, that is producing, you know, um, uh, good, good margins and good profits. So like, we're going to be able to get you an exit at a good multiple here. And I think they were always able to look at that and go, okay, I buy into that. Um, you know, I don't know if they all thought it would take 10 years before we got to that <laughs> liquidity point, but you know, that was kind of, uh, on the other hand, there wasn't, they, most of them had the opportunity to sell some of their stock into the FTV deal that had, that, that happened in 2016. And at that point, the company was just like really, really scaling and growing. And they're just like, I don't want to sell now. Like it's just mm -hmm. starting to get really, really good. Yeah. yeah. So, so awesome. yeah. Well, uh, I love talking to you, Aaron, and uh, I could probably ask you a bazillion more questions, but uh, part of what we do at Startup Happy Hour is an Ask Me Anything. Sure. Uh, so we want to go ahead and let our audience ask questions, and uh, you can do that uh, if you raise your, what we call your Zoom hand, which you'll find in the re reactions area, we can call on you to, to unmute and ask your question. Uh, or you can put a question in the chat. So I'm not seeing any hands yet. Jeff, help me out if I'm- Oh, there's Jamie. Jamie Bill has a question. Okay. So uh, Jamie, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask. How are you, friend? Hi, Kay. <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Good. Awesome. Uh, well, I skipped watching the new episode of Succession for this, so. Uh, <laughs> No, that's but awesome. Honestly, I feel deeply honored. <laughs> I have basically a billion questions about category creation. Yes, so I'm gonna try and and keep it semi concise and okay. maybe your brain a different time, uh, more in depth. But sure. essentially, um, I think I'm accidentally doing category creation. <laughs> And I kind of understand it from a marketing perspective. I know we talked a lot um, at Rescalize about, you know, if you're the category creator, you kind of have to, to do double the work in marketing okay. to both um, create awareness for the category and create awareness for your own brand right. within it. But right. outside of marketing or just in general, having seen it um, over the years and having done it. And even if you knew you were doing it while yeah. you were doing it, yeah. are, what are your general thoughts about creating a category? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's category creation is stinking hard. It's extremely powerful, but it's hard. And part of the reason why it's hard, I think is because I feel like everybody's trying to do it right. So like every single 
nobody wants to be the same as anybody else. So everybody's decided to try to be a category creator, even if they don't actually have a different category. And so as a result, there's a lot of noise in all of that. And um, so my, my it, I don't know if it's an insight or half of an insight, but my, my half of an insight there is, um, and, and by the way, I, I should look more closely at the how you've been doing the category creation at Workspace, but like, um, I, I, you see, so you may already be doing this, but I'll just say this. One of the things that struck me that we did really successfully in our category creation of risk alignment platform is we told the story of why the category should be created. I feel like a lot of, um, uh, of that, you know, and I, I, I I, I don't know. I see in a lot of places where people are trying to create like a, you know, a, a hair, a hair's width of difference between these two products to try to create a category. And they're just like, well, this is the, this category. And it's different because here are the differences. Okay. And it's like, interesting, but you've got to, you've got to sell me on why you think we need a different category there. Um, and, you know, I think about the pieces of your marketing I have seen at Workspace, and I feel like you're definitely trying to tell that story in a really great way. So, so I'm not sure how helpful that is, but I think that's so critical for category creation, because if you're not telling the story of why the category should exist, I don't know that it has credibility. Um, and, and that's, that's an interesting challenge. And, and I've, I, I guess I would say the other, the only other thing I would say there is if you don't feel like that's resonating enough then maybe you need to think about what the product needs to do to try to create even more space. Um, and I don't know what that is. I think that's different for every product, but there were, I know that there were probably product decisions that we made along the way where we specifically chose to be different in a way that created problems for us, but turned out to be better. And part of the better was that it cemented that we were different and therefore were worthy of having a category. Hope that helps. Great question. All right, let's go to um, Keyshot. Did you spell your name right? Isn't there an R in there? <laughs> well, if you're a Dodgers pitcher, but I don't, I don't know if. <laughs> go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, Kashav. Yes. There's a V in there. Okay. Yes, there's a V. So my question for you uh, is, um, how do you test? or slash verify if somebody meets your company culture when you bring them in. And at the same time, for example, when you're hiring engineers, is there like a certain curve or like a peak of like, okay, skills versus culture? Like you were saying like, oh, when you've hired, yeah. when it's like always the culture that's been the better decision. But is there a point where it's like, oh, this person's skills are better or it's like lacking? So how do you, how do you verse it, that? It's a great, that is a fantastic question. And here's the problem. You need both. Like you need both. So it's a, it's a really big filter on, on kind of the world and on the talent that you can hire. And it's a challenge. It's one of the reasons why we're a more global organization today than we ever have been before. Because, you know, first of all, we have to compete with every other technology company on, you know, uh, in the United States for US based talent. Okay. And, um, and second of all, um, all of those people are now working, uh, you know, remotely. So at the end of the day, um, we're sitting there going, we've got to, you know, get, make ourselves as competitive in other markets as possible to try to find enough talent that is, you know, really great on competence and really great on culture. And so I would just tell you that, like, if you compromise on either, it's going to be a real problem, right? If you, if you hire the wrong people that don't have skills, you're going to have really nice people. Um, Jamie, do you remember the term that we used? I'm trying to remember what it was. It was like talented jerks. There it is. It's coming back to me. You, we are, we're, you know, we, we can't afford to hire talented jerks or really nice idiots. Like we can't <laughs> afford to have either of those. Okay. So you really have to work. And then what's really bad is when you get idiot jerks in the culture. And that's what I feel like we hit there for a little bit in 2018 and 2019. It's like, I felt like I, I wanted to yell, like, was our hiring criteria can fog a mirror? Like, what, what was the criteria here? Um, but anyway, you've got to have both. And it's a real challenge. I would tell you that hiring and recruiting is one of, I mean, I enjoy parts of it and enjoy meeting new people and talking to people. And it's also like the bane of my existence because, um, you know, like it's a never ending battle 
to sift through the world and try to find ways to get people who are great on culture, great on competence. And you end up passing on some really smart people that aren't the right fit for your culture. And frankly, some really nice people that don't have the skill sets that you need. And that's a challenge. And then with that challenge, so when you're testing for competence, to me, that seems a little more straightforward because you can just have tasks yes. and see if they can do it. But when you test for the culture, how do you verify like this person meets your culture? Is there a certain like ta- setup you have, system that you have that, okay, this person yeah. meets their culture by the questions you ask them? Yeah, so, so really there's a there's an old adage that says you can bullshit anybody for 90 minutes, but once you get past that, the truth starts to come out, right? And um, uh, we we have a pretty extensive hiring process. We let the hiring team customize it for the front end because they're hiring for their competencies, right? So they need to be able to interview people to understand competencies. But throughout that process, we are asking people, we we're asking that hiring manager to fill out what we call a nine values assessment and asking them to say, we have nine values and we have like 15 different angles on those values. And we're saying, you know, do you see evidence that this person it, you know, reflects this value or not, and 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 tell us more about those um, those you know your evidence around that. And exactly what Jamie just wrote into the chat, it was more about if they answered the questions based on the values, right? Exactly. So then we ended up with you know that hiring manager. When we get to the end of the hiring process, and they're going to bring in that nine values interview, they take that assessment across fifteen different angles and hand it to the nine values interviewer, who's able to go, okay. I've got some threes or twos on some of these, and I've got some that are blank. That's where I'm going to focus my questions about values and culture, okay? Because that's going to let me kind of fill out the rest of the picture. And um, ultimately, that's how we kind of get to both. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for explaining. Dr. Shav is a, uh, an engine, you're an engineering student, right? Yes, uh, electrical engineering. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Genevieve, are you ready to ask your question? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Or does that mean? Or that She's must got be a touch on screen. Phone. She's trying to. <laughs> trying to. <laughs> <laughs> trying to. All right. If you want to type your question in the chat, we can we can get to that. Yeah, while Genevieve's yeah. typing her question, you know, Tom says, what about the adage that says you can teach skills easier than culture? I think that that can be true. That said, in a, in a, I, I, I can't even just say a startup because we're not technically a startup anymore, but in a startup or in a smaller company, like you also don't have time to like wait around for people to get the skills that you need, right? So like, you, uh, and that's not a, that's, that's actually an incorrect blanket statement because there may be some roles where you have the time and you have the ability to like hire somebody who maybe is a little bit less expensive, less experienced, but you're going to develop them in that role. We have roles that we do that in, but there's a lot of roles where we just do not, there's no way that we have the time to like wait for somebody's skills to catch up. So you're right. It is easier to teach skills than culture, but um, it, it, a lot of times you really have to like use the filters and get both because you don't have time to wait for the skills to catch up. So um, Genevieve, you typed a question earlier in the chat. Oh, you're off mute. Okay, go ahead and ask. Awesome. So um, yeah, I'm uh, what they call in Orlando, hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> I have a computer, a desktop, a laptop, and a phone, and I tend to use my phone way too much. Okay. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm at the beginning stages. Don't get me wrong, even though I say I don't know a lot, I also do know a lot as far as you know, the basics of each and everything. And the more I don't know, the more I learn. Sure. And I think one of the things I'm getting caught up in is the cycle of 24 hours a day, like, okay, I need to know more about this. I need to know more about that. Oh, okay, now I need to know about, then I find myself going, wait, where do I really start? It, it, in the beginning, you think, oh, okay, I need a software engineer. I need to work on crowdfunding. I need this. And then you find out, oh, there's 25 things I need to do in the beginning on top of all of the other stuff. Which one do I do Monday morning? And uh, when you've got everybody knocking on your door from every angle, where do you yourself find your center and start when you're at the very, very beginning stage? Yeah. I mean, I'll give you my thought. First of all, um, you know, you're in a 
it, it's always great to be in a place where somebody actually is knocking on your door because, you know, frankly, for a lot of people, the biggest problem is that nobody's knocking on their door, right? So that's a better place to be than, um, than, than many. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that one of the hardest things that I've had to develop as a CEO is the discipline to um, like really make choices and understand that like um, I can't do 15 things or 50 things or 100 things. I can do like three, um, you know, and, and depending on what that what that time frame is, um, you know, I can do three. So a, a big part of figuring out which three, I mean, that is the art that is whatever business you're trying to start there. And I can't tell you what those three are for you, right? You're going to have to sit down and go, what kind of business am I trying to start? And what are the most important things that I need to learn? If you're at the very beginning stages of a startup, it literally is like trying to turn over cards and learn things so that you can see how to build a winning hand and, and be able to, you know, to, to build a successful company. And so, you know, I would say that if, if it looks like all the different choices are equally as good to start with, well, then my only piece of advice is simply this, pick three. If it truly, if they're all equal, randomly pick three, okay? Have your grandson pick three. Uh, I saw him on the screen earlier in the breakout. He's awesome. Uh, have your grandson pick three, okay? Like, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to, I have this problem in spades. Our company had this problem in spades where we would make 1% progress against like a thousand different priorities. Okay. Like that is not useful. And we, we finally got like, um, and, and Jamie really helped us get this in place. Like we got objectives really put into our organization, OKRs, rocks, you can call them whatever you want to call them. But like everybody has three to five things. They go, if I do nothing else, I'm going to do these three to five things this quarter. And that has allowed us to score, you know, about 500 touchdowns, take the three to five and multiply it by our 200 people, right, ish. And, and like, we're scoring lots of touchdowns now rather than making one yard of progress against like a thousand different things, okay? Um, so it's, it's gonna be great for you if you can score three touchdowns during the next three months. Um, don't do a little bit of work on a thousand different things. Okay, uh, if I may uh, narrow it down. If, if you're working on something to do, quote unquote, e-commerce, also an app combined together, but not, I'm not talking about clothing store groceries. I don't mean that type, but a service um, where they will have a subscription and it's already a billion dollar market. And I'm offering something that hasn't been offered yet that people have been longing for. And uh, so what, I, what I'm asking is with something like that at the forefront, what would be your advice in the first three things and then do i yeah. trust places like studios that can do that or do i go elsewhere to, to begin my journey yeah so um here's what i would tell you when i hear you say that you you sound like you've got like a vision for um maybe not a jeff bezos scale business but like you're getting there okay and it's exciting because you've got a great vision for what it's going to be. And my greatest encouragement to you is this, and I can't tell you what the three things are. I can't tell you what thing you should focus on first, and I can't tell you exactly who to trust. But what I can tell you is this, you need to take that great vision, okay? And you need to work it backwards and go, what is the smallest elemental thing that I can do and put out in the world that will start creating some forward motion, okay? we believed that our business was going to be a lot more than a simple risk number. Okay. But we started by shipping a risk questionnaire and a little bit of basic portfolio analysis as one small product, because if we waited until we built the big vision, we never would have gotten any traction in the marketplace. So you've got to figure out how to bring that great vision you have, and you might get there in five years or 10 years or 20 years. I don't know. Okay but you got to bring that down to the most elemental small piece first. And, you know, Square started as a tiny little credit card reader, right? Like uh, they didn't have like the whole ecosystem of things that they started. Twitter started as like one dumb little text box. Like you've got to start really small and get traction with what is really small before you can start adding things on in that vision. You've got to decomplicate the vision for now. So last question, should I hold back? 
or should I start my own? Like, you know, they have Canva and they have all the little stuff. That I, I don't know. I don't know what tactics you should use because it depends which elemental thing you're going to, you're going to try. Right. So mm -hmm. that's the deal. That's situational. So I can't really tell you that, but what I can tell you is you, you, you've got to spend your first, I would spend the next two or three weeks simply figuring out how I take the big vision and find an on-ramp into the big vision and just bring it down to something super small. Then those decisions are going to get a lot easier because you're like situationally, how do I build this really small thing? What's the fastest way to do it? Okay. That Jeff. makes more sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I just posted, there's a seminar tomorrow that you might want to go to Arlene, maybe you can post the link to register. It's uh, testing business ideas with David Bland. So I'd recommend all early stage entrepreneurs learn about that. It's a little bit different than the prioritizing that you were talking about, but uh, it also helps you uh, figure out That's what cool. do your customers That's a want. skill set. Yeah. You probably could have used that about 10 years ago. So yeah. anyway. Oh, Actually, it, was it was today. today. Oops. Oops. Oh, no. Well, I oh, think there's recording. a recording. It says yeah. that was today. We can share the recording. Fantastic. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Cool. awesome. I, there's so many things going on this week. All right, Jeff, you're up with your question. Yeah, so thanks. So, um, Aaron, you mentioned relationships and networks a couple of times. And so I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit for early stage entrepreneurs about the importance of building those connections throughout your entrepreneurial career. Oh, yeah. I mean... So one of the things that is challenging, right, is that, um, and, and we've all seen it, where a lot of people just want to network for the sake of networking, okay? And so I do think that there is, um, networking, I think, is something that is worthwhile to put time into and effort into, but just understand that there's a law of diminishing returns. And at some point, like, you're not going to network your way to a successful business, um, but I, I absolutely believe that on the flip side, if you just said, I'm not going to do any networking, I'm just going to go into my, you know, my, my hole and code or, or, uh, or, or, or develop a product or whatever, you're probably not going to have um, the, the help that you need to get it off the ground. I mean, I think about that. I go, I, if I hadn't done some level of network, on the one hand, if I just networked all the time, I probably would have never gotten the business off the ground. On the other hand, if I'd done no networking, I wouldn't have met Josh Morgan who helped me with PR and helped me, you know, get the initial validation that caused Riskalyze to take off. Okay. Um, I, there's a whole bunch of other people that invested in the company, helped the company, became board members for the company, you know, did a whole bunch of different things. I never would have met them without that networking. So it's, it's such a balance because if you're just a professional networker and that's all you do, you won't get to success. If you, on the other hand, if you do no networking, I've met people who are just kind of like, introverts and they just don't like it and they don't do it. And, and then they're not going to have the networking connection that's going to allow them to be successful. Okay. So it's such a balance between those things. Great. Thanks. So uh, Hussein, you have a question. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, quick yeah. question on, in terms of, I guess, when you're uh, discovering your customers, yeah. Uh, what was the most efficient way of contacting them? Oh, man, that was hard. Um, with financial advisors, you know, it turned out to be email. Um, I would tell you that, like, when, when Jamie arrived, she's like, we are quite one dimensional in how we contact and reach out to our customers. We can do this a lot better. And we all looked at her skill set and what she was, and, and you know, her, I, I remember her first deck. I don't, know, I don't know if you remember this, Jamie, but like uh, Jamie's first deck, uh, uh, which wasn't even addressed to me, but it made its way to my desk. And I just like opened it up and I'm like paging through this. And I'm like, holy shit, there's a lot that we're not doing um, that we should be doing. And so um, there, you know, that's a multidimensional thing. But in the early days, we were just like going simple. We were contacting financial advisors by email and trying to get them interested in the product and trying to give them a taste of the product. And, um, and that was kind of our, our approach. Um, I did use for things that are consumer based, I did use, and I had mixed results with usertesting.com. You can pay to have, you know, um, average people basically come in and you can control some of the demographics, but like have people come in and use your product. Um, I had some good results with that and some really bad results with that. And it was just kind of a mixed bag. Um, but you know, what I love about, I heard a little bit about your company in the breakout room. What I loved about it is that like you're living in the midst of the users that you're trying to attract, 
right? Yeah. And yeah. so that's really the best place to be. I mean, that's a big benefit compared to where I was because I wasn't living with any financial advisors and they weren't just like inviting me to be a fly on the wall in their office, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Uh, I hear, and I don't, you would probably know better than I do, that in, in Sacramento region that we don't have good depth in product management, that a lot of the tech companies here are uh, reaching out to Bay Area for that. And I notice, like in the Bay Area, there are a lot of workshops and classes and things on product management, and, and we don't have that here. I wondered, what's your, your thought on that? And how do founders become better product managers? Because uh, early days, you're the product manager. Oh, right? for sure. I was the product. I was our product. In fact, people joke that I'm still our lead product manager today. Um, but it's more of a joke, trust me. Because um, product manager becomes a, this is what we should do with the product. And it becomes a real skill as you scale and grow and have lots of engineers to work with. Um, you know, one of the things I would venture to bet, Laura, that one of the things that drives that is... Um, not so much that we have a dearth of product managers here as much as product management is a discipline where industry specific knowledge and, and subject matter expertise can be critically important. When I think about like hiring a product manager for our trading product, okay, we couldn't find one locally, like there's not going to be a product manager for our trading product locally. Um, and, and we were trying to find a good product manager who could manage that. And frankly, we couldn't afford the ones that had good subject matter expertise, but that's a very, um, uh, you know, like technical uh, undertaking. And so we ended up hiring somebody in like Dallas, Texas, who was um, really, really knowledgeable about that part of the industry. And we, we finally worked hard enough that we found one that we could hire. And then we took one of our great product managers locally, who was still kind of developing in his career, and we paired the two of them together um, for mentoring. And now like that guy who's local is probably one of the, I mean, seriously, like top 10 product managers in the field of like trading investment accounts in the world. Um, I would put him up against anybody because he's so knowledgeable. He's got an always be learning mindset. He's, he, and he has turned himself into an expert in that field. He understands it really well. And I put him up against anybody. Um, so I, I, a lot of times that just takes, um, you know, being, you may need to find people who are not subject matter experts and then try to hire mentoring for them or find consultants that can coach them or things like that to try to build that capability. But I think that that's more of like product management is simultaneously, um, one of the easiest things to say that you are right and one of the hardest things to actually do well, I think. Um, I, I, I think that it's really, a lot of people just say, I'm kind of a product person. It's like, don't put me in sales and put me on commission, but I'm also, <laughs> I can't write code, right? Like it's easy to say I'm a product person. Yeah. Um, and I, but it takes a lot of skill to be a really, really great product person. And I certainly was not a great product person. I think when I um, was at like the options brokerage firm, I learned really, really quickly. And that was probably my one um, advantage there. And then I, I, you're right. I was the product person, you know, when, when risk started. So I kind of honed those skills um, in the school of hard knocks. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, Hussan has a question and then we have time for one more question. So if somebody All wants right. to ask the next question, get your hand up, go ahead. Um, so for your revenue model, uh, I guess you uh, probably made one. Uh, did you in any way change it up? If so, how did you not? Yeah, I mean, you know, remember at the beginning, we were going to do that. The, the vision was to do that deal with like, you know, one big, like a licensing deal with one big uh, retail, you know, firm, and then use all that revenue to like fund building out the advisor product we wanted to build. And then we were going to go and do and use kind of the SaaS software business model with financial advisors. And then that didn't work out. So we ended up scrapping that entire licensing model and basically just going off in the SaaS software side of things. I think one of the things that's really challenging, and, and this is, you know, I, the only thing I can really encourage you to do, just knowing a little bit about the kind of business you're trying to build, is you, you, you just need to do a lot of reading 
on mm -hmm. how different businesses with that kind of business model have worked. Um, you know, what I and, and, and what I mean by that, by the way, is an indirect, you know, revenue model where you're not going to collect the money from the person who is using the product. You're mm -hmm. going to collect the money from other from other places. So there's a lot of ways to think about that business model. There's marketplace concepts. There's advertising concepts. There's um, all of those are hard. Indirect revenue models are really hard. I don't think I'm very good at indirect revenue model businesses. I just don't, you know, like I've, I've, I've toyed with doing that a little bit. I tried doing that with Riskalyze. I tried, you know, and I just, I was not very good at indirect revenue model businesses. Mm -hmm. And I, I, part of that is I came to realize that I, I actually had a pretty good skill set in kind of the SaaS software business model. And I decided to go in that direction. I think it's really interesting as micropayments become more um, possible to mm -hmm. actually ask yourself, like, you know, is there a way that I can take the product I'm building and the vision I'm building and make it valuable as a direct revenue model to the user? That's an interesting question. WhatsApp did that for the, for, you know, and it was surprising, right? Everybody's like, you can't charge for a messaging app. That doesn't work. WhatsApp went free for a long time until they just sucked everybody in. And there was so much value that everybody was willing to pay a buck a month to have WhatsApp. Okay. So maybe there's a direct revenue model there that you can make happen if you can get some really good growth. But really, that's going to be an expensive business to build. You've got to show some viral you know, user growth. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to get venture capitalists willing to pour in capital to let you scale that to enough growth that it becomes worthwhile to introduce a revenue model. Yeah. And that's just a, a that's a very different thing than I've I've ever had experience with. And you're going to have to find the right kind of venture capitalist willing to fund that. And they exist out there, but they're going to specialize in like, like look at Union Square Ventures in New York, USV.com. They specialize in startups that build engaged networks of users and then apply revenue models later. Like that's literally what they do. And there's probably other competitors to them that do that. Is there a reason why your I guess, private licensing didn't work? Um, I just think that I don't know. That's a great question. I part of it was that there were only five potential customers. And so it might have just been luck. And part of it may have been that, um, that, you know, I wasn't thinking I didn't understand real well how to satisfy that market. And so I found more success by going to a market where I was going to make less money per customer, but there were, uh, you know, several hundred thousand customers to go after. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's probably one or the other. Okay, I see that Brian got his crypto plans question. We got to go to that, Laura. Okay. okay, last last question is Brian's He bought his question. ticket just to ask this question. <laughs> I mean, Brian, are you going to ask it on screen? I can see he's laughing. Well, yeah, sure. Well, sure, if you want me to. I just don't Okay, go, Brian, go. I just don't want to hog the uh, mic here oh. too much. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, um, Riskalyze does a great job analyzing how risky a person is and how risky a stock portfolio is, but yeah. when are you going to start telling me how risky is my Ethereum? How risky is my Bitcoin? How risky is my Brave? How risky is my Litecoin? There you All go. This sort of okay. Stuff. Well, I can tell you your Bitcoin is risk 99. And yes. I can tell you yeah, that I know that. So it's risk 99, but then above. Are also probably 99. So um, I, I, we, we're having lots of discussions around this. Uh, financial advisors, are definitely like way behind the curve in terms of wanting to actually allocate client accounts to, to crypto, but it's coming and we're building towards it because it is coming. Um, and what every financial advisor deals with right now is their clients walking through the door, owning some crypto and needing to put that into the mix to understand how to look at the actual risk of, the, of how they're invested today. So every financial advisor wants to do that. And even though all the crypto coins may be risk 99, it's actually much more interesting than that because they all behave differently from each other. They're not all the same. And when you add Ethereum into a portfolio, it may correlate differently or anti-correlate differently from different ETFs, mutual funds, and stocks compared to putting Bitcoin or Brave or any of those other coins in a portfolio. So it's much more interesting than just what's the risk number of the coin, because yeah, they might all be 99, like our max number, but like how they behave in a particular portfolio is super interesting to a financial advisor. So we're, we're actively working on it. Don't have any announcement to make quite yet, but we're actively working on it. And there will be more crypto and risk lies in the future because I, I, I am a, I am, I am, I am part of a small group of bulls on crypto inside of Riskalyze. Like I believe that the blockchain 
has a lot of applications that are going to be, I, I, at some point, every stock will be traded on a, on a blockchain exchange. Every bond is going to be traded on a blockchain exchange. It doesn't make any sense that custodians get paid huge sums of money because we don't trust each other when technology exists that allows us to do that, right? So, you know, to me, that makes me really bullish on, on what's going to happen with crypto in the future. Uh, I, I can't predict what's going to happen to Bitcoin or Ethereum, but I, I feel like the whole space is a big part of our future. And so we're going to keep building towards that. And yeah, I think you guys are in a great position to do great things. In, uh, in Thank the, you. And, and when you do have a something to announce, uh, I know a Bitcoin group in Sacramento, you can announce it. Oh, too. okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Yeah. And Brian, put that into the chat box. And Brian, and Brian, does that Bitcoin group have a meetup coming up anytime soon? You should put that into the into the chat. Yes, it does. <laughs> in, uh, in Folsom, uh, we're meeting up and uh, we meet on the second and fourth Monday of the month. It's a Sacramento Bitcoin meetup. If you're on meetup, uh, check it out. And sometimes sometimes we convince Laura to put it in the newsletter. So <laughs> I love it. I love you, it. you have to have a description of who's going to be speaking. Oh yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's Sadale who who has um, uh, who who has grants. Uh, he he, he talks about grants. grants. We're going to be in crypto. I yeah. think you guys know Sadale. Yep. Okay. Cool. That's All awesome. right. Well, we're we're running out of time. Um, Aaron, this has been great. We'll, Thank we'll you. We'll have to get you back here again, uh, maybe next year. And I just want to thank you so much. I know that you. You're a father, a husband. You got three teenagers now, I think. I know. It's and, nuts. Uh, you travel all over the place. So we really appreciate you spending some time with us. 